this. So first and foremost, I hope y'all doing good. I hope wherever you hear these voices at, you feel it great. Because right now, we bought the grace you with our presence. Welcome to More Than Words podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Shara, and we have... Um, oh, I'm Liz. Dang it, we messed that up again. <laughs> See, you know that if you know us, you know that's our thing. So you got Sharon and Liz here. We are officially known as the aunties of inclusion. And today we're doing something special. It's not our normal, typical format, right? Like, you know, we like to have a long conversation with you. But today we couldn't help it because that report, y'all know what I'm talking about. That one, okay, that 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 one came out. So okay. I messaged, I messaged Shara and I was like, the great breakup. Let's talk about it because we've been using voice notes. I'm proud of us for being so technological because we've been using voice notes and I think it's so funny and also being so like far away from one another, hearing our voices, even though I know we do the podcast like every week. Yes. We do. And we and we and we have plenty of time with each other. But if you don't know what report we're talking about and you haven't seen it yet, we are talking about the leanin.org and McKinsey and Company annual report about women in the workplace. It's a study that they do every year. It's highly anticipated. It's um hundreds of companies that get involved. Um, I think they had like a 600 uh, participate usually big, small, medium uh, startup, whoever decides that they want to share their information. And what they're trying to do is collect and get research about the women women in the workplace and their experiences. Now, listen, if you've never heard of this report, this is one of them ones you put on your list because you want to know, guess why? Because it's usually telling you exactly what you have been seeing in the last year and also what you need to be prepared for for the coming weeks. But Liz, when you got it, when you hit me with the no, I said, I think we in the report at the same time. <laughs> I was like, I was on like my little hands. Was, you know what I love about this report? It's it has so many facts, right? It has for people who like, you know, the facts and the ratios and the details, and they like graphs and bars and everything. Because here's the thing: did it surprise you? No. No, it didn't. It didn't surprise me. But you know how often sounds when you're trying to share that there is a different experience and there's a different in experience, even though we're all sharing an experience. So for example, we all can feel the great resignation. We can all kind of feel this breakup happening. Um, but at the same time, we're all experiencing it differently. And right. this report calls it out very distinctly, right? Like why women of color? feel different why black women why latina women like all of these differences that show up and why those experiences even though similar can feel different or have a different feel to it or experience to it so i was just happy i was just like validate thank you let's talk about exactly i was just gonna say that i was like you know what it made all of these experiences valid right the the black woman experience the latina experience women with disabilities the intersectionalities you and i we haven't really gotten into intersectionalities a lot but we have talked about it here and there in some of our episodes and i'm i'm not surprised and the one thing that i love can i just talk say the one part that I love to highlight it in like multiple colors because I am a career-driven woman I've always been my hustle is strong y'all it comes back from generations of my abuelita and my bisabuelita it's great grandmother um we're just like naturally born hustlers like we're just gonna work and work and work so my ambition was never to be a stay-at-home mom or, I mean, I went to university because I, di- I, I didn't want to stick to the stereotype of my culture, which was to uh, get married and have kids. Now, I am married and I have kids, but I did that way later in life. I established my career and who I am first. And I am still very career driven. I mean, at the moment, my husband is the caregiver of our family. And that's something special, right? That's just what our family dynamic is. So what I loved about it is this report talked about women's ambition. It did. And it used the word quite quite frequently throughout. Throughout. They, yeah, yeah. And they and that's the first, I agree. I think that was interesting that they named it ambition and they stopped that work-life balance conversation because, you know, it's really never a balance. It's always an integration, but- Listen, I'm with you. I was surprised to see that language, but at the same time, 
similar to just I want to give a shout out to Beyonce with the Renaissance album. It was just like a, <laughs> it was like a sign of the times. It was like she had read the room, okay, and then this report read the room and was like, okay, let's talk to y'all differently, okay. We recognize that the way we've been talking about this has definitely not connected with y'all the way it should. We're gonna use some different language here, and it did. No, I love the the fact that they use ambition because yeah, I am just as ambition as men. There is no difference. Just because we're I'm I'm a woman and he's there, that's a man, you know, or whatever gender preference you uh, uh choose, whatever preference you are, um, I'm just as ambitious and I have goals and dreams and I want to advance in my work. I want to I I want to be up there. And whatever I need to do, I'm going to do. Now, the thing is what happens, and um, I know many women share this and something that definitely, I'm all, I'm all like (laughs) here, something that really resonated with me. And I've seen so much in a lot of clients that I coach. It's this um, like feeling that they're at the end of of their journey or that they're just going to give up or that this is it for them. Like I can't give anymore. And this report really called that out because yes, we're just as ambitious as men, but we're having to work way harder to advance. And then we have all of these different things that are, are coming at us, right? They talked a lot about microaggressions, but I know that makes very people uncomfortable um, with the word microaggressions. And what was the term that Tawana uh, coined us uh, at CDI Symposium the other week about? Freedom and liberation? It? No, it was, it, was talking, coaching. it was about microaggressions. I need to find my notes oh, on that. But you're talking about microaffirmation. Microaffirmations. That's another one that could be in there too. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and in addition, and we've seen it so many times in people that we've coached and also people, when we do our facilitation, who's reaching out to us? Women, okay. women of color. That's who's reaching out to us because yeah. they're the, it's so important. They know that this work is super critical and they're the ones that are leading this diversity, equity, and inclusion work. They're also leading the work in uh, the well-being of companies. So they are actively, women are actively shifting the culture and improving the culture so that you can retain your workforce. My question is, why aren't the men being allied, stepping up? And I'm not, no, I'm generalizing, don't attack me. But where are the men in this? It's almost like, I always talk about, uh, parenting and um, di- family dynamics in the household where the women carry the mental load of the household. And it's like, we're taking that process of carrying the mental load of the household and applying it to our workspace. Yeah, I don't think, I, there's some. The, there's a couple of things here. So I would say, you know, I think there are men in the fight, right? But it takes just the amount of collective to get involved to actually make a shift here, right? There's tons of men allies. I've worked with great individuals. I have coached great men where they have made strategic differences in their teams and within the organizations that they're in. The issue is it's not a collective movement, right? Like we are only a, a, a half of the population. The other half got to do their part collectively too, right? But But when you talk about Make a space, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about mm-hmm. making space in places where, you know, currently women are underrepresented, uh, specifically around this report. And I would say this is where those things around the scarf model that we've talked about before, where we're really starting to talk, deal with people fight or fight, right? Yeah. We're dealing with their responses because you're asking them, and oftentimes we've done a horrible job at communicating this, where we're asking them about the or and not the end. Meaning, okay, so, you know, you know, this person, uh, male is um, c- up for promotion, but, you know, we also have, you know, Shara over here who could be, could do the same job, but, you know, you never know. She's at that age where she may want to have kids. We don't know, da, 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 right? The dialogue. And she's, and she's going to pick either your career or your family. Or Correct. when you're pregnant, I have a friend of mine who just had a baby and they were, at, and they were having discussions in front of her. 
her about Absolutely. her not coming back. Like yes. saying, oh, we're going to put this uh, plan here of you, you, you might not come back. And I'm like, did they ask you? <laughs> they don't. They never do. Uh, and let me they say never. I will say the people who do, they do. But when it gets communicated as a person who's been in the HR world um, or in the HR world, I will say it's always communicated with a question mark at the end, no matter how definitive the statement is. Meaning, yeah, she's coming back. But it's like, well, you remember the per- Jan, you know, Jan back in 2017 didn't come back, right? Like it's something crazy, right? That kind of filters the lens of that. But I don't want to go into absolute because I feel like there's a lot of allyship in this work. But I do want to recognize that the shift in language in this report, specifically around giving, giving power or empowerment into the report, where it's not specifically so heavily weighted around work-life balance, um, where to your point around really bringing in that the 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 pieces that often challenge us in this is our challenge, right? In these conversations about advancement and progression, but oftentimes they change the language to say, "Hey, ambitious, career driven." Um, you know, they started to speak a little bit about the the problem with the perspective of how women are viewed in the workplace when you think about them That's progressing. Right. And they actually started giving some really good examples about like the serious implications of it. Now, is this new? No, but the language has changed to kind of sound the alarm and align it so that one, that there's a little bit gender neutrality when it comes to the conversation now about career and drive and ambition in this report, particularly. And also it's getting really to the point that they sounded the alarm, because I will say in the previous ones, I, this alarm is a silent. I feel like this is the highest the, this volume has been in this particular report about, okay, y'all, so y'all had a couple of years to read this report and try to get it together. But let me just tell you, y'all had no more time. That's what I took away from the language. Yes, of the of it. Your time and like, is up. And there's yeah. some serious implications about what your workforce is going to look like if you don't open up, open up your eyes right now. So here's the five things that was listed. Okay, so within this great breakup, if you're just joining us, basically, it's basically saying women are demanding more from work and they're leaving their companies in unprecedented numbers, right? Um, And that's not different for any, in general, we're in a part of a great resignation. We've been talking about it for, you know, almost years now, okay, Um, since the pandemic. So I will say, here we are. We have five big pieces that came out of this report. And of course, this is a 60 page report. So, you know, it's plenty of more gems in there. But here's the five that the leanin.org highlighted. And I, I would agree for this conversation. Okay, so one, companies have a new pipeline problem, meaning that there is serious implications on how um, organizations and companies are struggling in holding on to um, women leaders right? And that there's something called a broken rung, which you need to go look at the definition and talk about it, but basically says that for every man, right, or every hundred men that are promoted from an entry level to a manager, only 87 women are promoted, right? And on, of that 80, 87, 82 of those women are of color. So basically saying, one, the promotion rates are not there. There's still this issue with the pipeline working, right? That's one. Two, women leaders want to advance, but they are facing stronger headwinds, right? So that broken, that ceiling that we keep talking about, the ceiling is there, right? But now it's actually pulling us backwards, right? That means, so part of that is amongst all the employees who switched their careers in the past two years, 48% of the women say they did so because they wanted more opportunities to advance, meaning they want to get there. The opportunity is there, but they are not receiving the opera, they are not being um, considered qualified or they're being more critically judged around the openings, right? And, and some of them are not even getting credit for the work that they've done and pe- they're finding ways to credit others, specifically males around it, which leads us into number three, which is women leaders are overworked and under-recognized. Come and say it to the back of the 100%. Audience. Say that again, Sharon, because I don't oh think my the, God. Back, the back back heard it. Back the back, 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 okay. Back. Uh, women okay. leaders are overworked and under recognized. And here in the, in the report, it just talks about the level of exhaustion. If you read this section, I felt exhausted when I was doing it. It was basically this conversation, very eloquently put it, <laughs> that spending time and energy on work isn't recognized 
um, uh, as equally um, valued. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it even life. said that 40% of women leaders say their DEI work wasn't even acknowledged in their performance reviews. I mean, how many times have we seen that in, in our facilitations where it's like, well, I'm doing all this inclusivity work, but I can't put it on my performance review because it's not considered real work. But even though it's impacting your culture directly. Right. And that that DNI work, right? That shows up. And, and and the big conversation in here is that's not, that should not be seen as something that is adverse for women. It is a requirement for real people leaders, right? To yeah. be in this time to look at the full well-being of their employees. And so in this particular piece, I'll add to that to say, not only are they doing the DNI work, but they talk a lot about why women are doing more at work because they're trying to advance. They're trying to show people that they're able to do more and leave the organization differently and take those risks when they're not provided the opportunities for the job. So we know, know that. You know what I'm scared of, Cher? I'm scared that what we're doing is, and we are, like you're seeing it here in the numbers, right? And how many people, that, how many of your clients have you, um, coach that are completely burned out or they're considering leaving the workforce or they're, you know, um, they've left the workforce way earlier than their retirement age. And they have, you know, physical ailments, emotional ailments, work, workplace traumas, all that's all that things that now we're, we're having to like coach through, um, through all of this. I mean, there's some serious yeah. implications here. And also too, if all the women leave, like, you know, you said the first one, you have a pipeline issue. You're trying to diversify your workforce and bringing in more women in all spaces. What, yeah. what's happening there? Yeah. I, you know what you say that. And, and then I've, I've been mulling over it. The burnout has been pretty extensive, right? I feel I have felt that in the coaching work for a number of years now about the burnout, right? Like we're catch coaching. This is what I love about what Tawana, Dr. Tawana Burris is doing about democratizing coaching, because we catch our, these executives that we work with or these senior leaders way too late. The burnout has been going on for so long that it's become a part of their actual practices of leader leading and, or like working with their families. They have just adapted and put in burnout as a part of one of the behaviors in their world, right? They have created a whole lifestyle around it instead of what is happening now, which is people are basically saying that's not what we're about to do. And that goes actually into the last two, which is the last two things that came up in this article was that women leaders want to see a seismic shift in the culture of work. Meaning, yeah. listen, burnout is not acceptable. Being overworked is not acceptable. But me being ambitious, excellent, highly committed to what it is that I want to do should not impede on the fact that there's other meaningful things that I want to give my time and attention to. I'll give you an example. We were just talking about employee resource groups, but oftentimes we hear, and, and you, and this one is usually shocking to most to hear, but it comes up quite a bit, where even women at the executive level or senior level are trying to get on boards, for-profit boards, corporate boards, and companies are basically putting in clauses to say, you can't be a part of a board and work here. So basically you're, you're limiting my opportunities at times in this organization, but now you're putting a very distinctive lens and handcuff, in my opinion, on women who want to go outside, serve in that leadership capacity, in most cases, bringing it back to your organization, lessons learned, best yeah. practices, et cetera. And you want to stop that because in your mind, that is some way taken away from what the contribution could be in your organization. And even people say, well, it could be a conflict of interest. It's only a conflict if it's not managed. Everything could be a conflict of interest in the business <laughs> it's just if you manage it appropriately. Yeah. Well, so, again, like it's like we're assuming, we're assuming. assuming that, assuming and we're saying the or, right? Instead of the big and. I'm just, well, that's going to be my post today on our Instagram. As we Instagram. should. And we keep like, them and, 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 no, and, and, and lastly, to your point, Liz, here we come. Companies are also at risk for losing young women. 
Young women is watching this happen and they are over it. They like, so we don't need to do exactly how y'all did it to get burnt out and then have all these issues. We don't want to be at the top, just living half of our life. We want to be able to bring all those great things that we contribute now into this organization so we can have a deeper commitment and flexibility around our life and what it is we can contribute in and outside the organization. The This is the statistic. More than two thirds of women under 30 say they care more than they did two years ago about flexibility and company commitment to well-being. Meaning they have said, okay, listen, we know y'all got issues with like pay equity. Okay, we're aware of that. We also know that there's some issues here with advancement and opportunity that might be the only in the room, but no, no, no. Where we gonna draw the line here is that the flexibility and the well-being that the company is committed to is important to me. And so if you don't care for me as a person, you don't put that in there as a priority, then I, you're, I'm you not staying here. And Absolutely. that's before you even say, put the lens of diversity, right? To say, if I'm a Latina or I'm a black woman or I'm an Asian woman or these other things that value, it's basically saying, if you just don't care that this human being is sitting in the seat and that I'm in my whole mind <laughs> and my whole health, then I ain't got time for you. And that right there is goes back to all the things that we talked about, the pipeline, facing those headwinds, those overworked people, the generation ain't having it. So go, where are you going to get the workers from? I hope the robots is coming. Where's the robots at? <laughs> you said you, the robots. <laughs> I, I listen, get the automation and get the quantum technology moving way <laughs> faster. Because let me tell you right now, you can't, the thing about this, we are, women are half of this population. And so when you start to disenfranchise that group in so many ways, what do you expect is going to happen to the, 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 the very essence of the cultures that you tried to create in your workplaces? You didn't include them, but they're valuable parts of your culture and why it works either well, in most cases, and or is it exceeding because it's the balance right? We can always say, oh, it's the executives, but no, no, no. The, the culture itself is framed by Absolutely. all the employees. The, the, we always talk about when we facilitate, the culture is a collective. Absolutely. It's not just one person. It's not like, you know, we, we always hear like, well, they're, they don't care about us, right? And it's always like outwardly, no. It, the whole collective is the one that makes the culture. The one thing that I did find interesting um, in this report too, is they talked about remote and hybrid workspaces and how that really does help women, right? From a from a from being able to do both, right? Take care of kids and have a career. Um, it also helps people with disabilities too, right? Being being more um, in their comfort zone. It also helps with you know now um, as a person of color. And you have those microaggressions every day, day and out, face to face. Now it's like, oh, I actually have like a, you know, a block on that mm -hmm. temporarily. A and I, it's a buffer. Exactly. That's a great word. It's a buffer. And, you know, and I can elect to who I speak with, you know, um, they did say, though, and I'm going to quote them exactly on the what the report said. It said remote and hybrid work can offer a reprieve from bias but it's not a substitute for systemic change. Mm. That's big because people are like, well, you should be happy. You're mm -hmm. working remote and hybrid. And they mm -hmm. also gave you a few kind of pointers or tips on, and I love this. And the last one is like, my, I love the last one, but they gave you a few tips on like how as a company, you can make this work. I love remote work. I do it. i I'm in my my casa, you know, every day. <laughs> in my little office with my new artwork, y'all. Yes, I love it. You know, I was eye hustling because that's what I do. I love the I eye hustle. Yeah, I got. I know. I'll, I'll put it in the link on who it is, um, on who the artist is, but she's an amazing artist. So first, this is like first of all, communicate plans and guidelines for flexible work. Be very specific on what your plans are. What are the guidelines so that there is more fairness and well, not fairness is like more equity between different genders, different abilities, et cetera. Give feedback, like con get constant feedback from your employees. Again, don't assume what your employees want or need or don't want or don't need. Go back, ask for feedback, 
actively ask for feedback uh, from your employees on that. The other one is find a way to create connectedness. Shara, you and I have made a whole relationship. We we, we started three businesses virtually, yeah. right? Go on the telephone the back. Hey, hey, come on the telephone the back. Hey, we got no business. Hey, okay. Wait, that was a celebration. I forgot we were serious. My man, I had to get that out. Because I was like, when you put the nails up, I was like, and one and two and three, and one and two and three. Hey, okay, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I digress. But yeah, I digress. it's like, we were able, we can do this. I can manage a whole team from this. I just have to be creative, right? And innovative. And and don't think about the good old days. Um, think about progressives. Like, okay, what is here today? What does my team need? And let it be authentic and let it be real, right? Yeah. Don't give me these fake things, but like make it real. And the yeah. last one, which I... Re- oh, go ahead, Sharon. I can't wait. I've been waiting for this one. You, saw, you saw my hand on my head? I know. There? Oh, like Put the face. Okay. The last one is be purposeful about in-person work. Don't make us come in just to come in because you want to see our faces and you're uncomfortable with us virtually and you don't have trust in us. Be purposeful on this. Those are the times like that's when you create the connectedness with people, right? Like having these in-person collaboration sessions and making them purposeful and having face-to-face people. This is where, and and I'll, I'll go back to something that, you know, we talked about, like my question on the, where the men as the allies. And I will say for me, you know, like I'm very blessed and lucky that I had a lot of, actually a lot of white men pull me forward. So yes, they, they're out there, they're doing work. And I had a lot of white men be my allies and my mentors and my sponsors and put me in spaces that, you know, I would have normally not been in or had no clue. I mean, my whole reason of where, where I am at in my life is because of a, of of a white guy giving me uh, direction (laughs) and advice. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I I thought that was really interesting. I will say, yes, I'm glad we covered that and specifically that one in detail, but I I have to say, when we talk about flexibility and hybrid work, I don't want this to be in the lens of somebody needs to go not do something that is advantageous for your job, right? So let me explain. When we, I hear people talk about flexibility, they're like, oh yeah, so people can go to Target or, you know, somebody can go watch TV while they're working and all this. At the end of the day, regardless of how people use their time, just because they're in the office don't mean they're using their time effectively either. Because there's been many times as a person being in HR, employee relations be high. People be watching movies. You got people doing a whole other job, moonlighting, two laptops here. Shoot, they done put a whole VPN on, on the computer and they run in two different companies, their own company. They got, listen, I'm seeing so many things. Right. So just because a person is there don't mean they present. OK, so just because they present, th- that's not what it is. But what I will also say is that don't believe the hype that people are not working their tails off, because that is what I've been seeing in social media. Like, oh, this millennial is only working five, you know, five hours a week to get all their work done. OK, but if that is what the article is about, then is not anybody going to ever ask about the other 30 some hours that this person could be utilized in a better way versus the fact that they only work in five hours. And second of all, if you're able to do your work in five hours, good for you for your level of efficiency. Um, Because really at the end of the day, that's the company not paying enough attention to you and what you're asking for, for your career. That means that your capability. Yeah. Like uh, this, these are my capabilities. These are my, yeah. Or your company let you skate. So where's the accountability, right? So either way, tap in, right, with those meetings. Lastly, the in-person stuff is really driving me crazy because it's like, why you tell need, it, tell it, Sharon, tell it. Why you need to see me all, like for no reason? Like you, I'm with you. Use my time wisely. I don't, I believe in connection. I'm an extrovert. Believe me, I love getting together. But it's nothing worse then knowing that I have to go back home and work four hours when we did not maximize the time we had together by making it just as meaningful as the virtual time. So I'm with you. I don't have any problem with happy hours. I love the good old holiday parties. 
the whole nine, but don't expect me, right? You're going to take me out the office for four days or four hours. I need you to then give me the, also the respect to be able to catch up at my work at a more reasonable time. And don't expect me to come back after whatever we have done and work four hours and get that report that you just told me about at the happy hour done by the morning. So let's just keep it all in context, right? Like let's be thoughtful about how we manage our people. And then one thing, Liz, we didn't go deep into is representation. So there is an amazing diagram in this report about representation. And this is a personal passion for me. So like I I use my external time or my discretionary time to volunteer um, with the organization that focuses on getting women on boards. And specifically, I've told them my focus is getting more women of color on boards. Um, and, and when I say women of color, I, I'm going with black women first, but I'm bringing everybody with me who, who come up in it, right? Like, I'm, I'm just being clear, because that's my network. That's where I can get the biggest reach. But, you know, I'm opening that to all of us, right? Uh, but when I tell you that chart, if you don't spend no time on that chart to say representation in corporate pipeline, gender and race, if you don't feel ill at the end of that, because let me just give you some context. So it basically is a chart that says what's the various big buckets over a company. So entry level manager, senior manager, I'm looking at it director, right now. VP, SVP, C-suite, right? And then it's at the side, it basically says, okay, you got white men, you got men of color, you got white women, women of color, and it breaks down into other races. But when you look at this diagram, it's, it's basically saying since 2017, when they started this study to now, what has been the change? When you think about entry level, the, the change for women, right? Not even putting the lens of women of color on it, just women in general has been only equivalent to one person change at entry level. Meaning that all this work we've been doing to, to help the pipeline, to get people from those individual contributors into being leaders, the percentage shift has only resulted in really one person, oh, no. one additional person getting through. That's entry level. Keep it. Let's keep going. Okay. We're going to go to the, ma the manager, the manager from 2017 to 2022, all this work we've been doing has only resulted to three more women getting through at that manager piece. Meaning that's probably a manager one, manager two, you know, whatever the case may be, the different, you know, people manager types without it being like a senior manager. So let's go to senior manager and director. Same thing. Only three more people have been able to get through since 2017, okay? So we got three, three, three people at the management level, three women getting through more than since 2017. Now, I, okay, let's keep going. When we get to the VP level, it's the same thing. Three women, only three more women, okay? And all these 600 organizations have gotten through since 2017, more, right? Okay, SVP, we got seven. Oh my gosh, seven SVP women has been able to get through since 2017. Yes, I'm being facetious. I am not excited about that. C-suite, we have six women actually getting to the C-suite since 2017. Now, let me tell you, I'm gonna give you two minutes, no, two seconds to count how many years it has been since 2017. And I'm also give you a minute to then go on and add, look at your organization, who are those people who got broke through in your organization in some of these buckets? And lastly, what was their behaviors or characteristics that allowed them, and I'm not saying they didn't earn it. So I'm gonna say they earned it, they was there, they was present, they did all the things. But what was the characteristics that they have that you would say is the collective of, those individuals. And I don't have an opinion on that per se. I'm just saying that that's typically the critical questions that I, as a person in, in HR and in this work will say, which is if they're going to pick people to break through, similar bias is normally going to show up. Um, affinity bias is just going to show up. Proximity bias is going to show up who I see who's closest to me, who went to my university, who's in my neighborhood, who I talk about, you know, who, who, what name keep coming up in the same conversation <clears throat> or in the same programs and events. So I'm not, I'm not saying that's what's happening, but I want you to be curious about your organization because I'm going to tell you right now, we spend a lot of time coaching I, and I specifically more recently coaching women who have assumed the traits of the majority of their organization, whatever that is, 
and they're struggling it because it doesn't fit in line with their value system. And that's what we talk about today. <laughs> because all this change, this one person, three person, it's like a Dr. Seuss novel. This is ridiculous. What we're talking about here is we've spent a lot of time making organizations very much so homogeneous places for the whoever is serving as the majority. And, and the, the one thing that you didn't, I'm sorry, sure. The one thing ahead, that you yeah. didn't you didn't mention on the women was being being specific on like white women and women of color. Because mm. as you get up into the C-suite, I think the percentage was whereas one in four women make it to the C-suite, it's one in 20 women make it to the C-suite. So there is a very clear distinction as to what women of color deal with. And I know- the numbers, Liz. Bring the numbers, please. I did. I did have an accounting background. So you better yeah. flex on them. <laughs> All right, Cheryl. Well, I think yes. we gave a lot of information yes. to people. We will post the report on the link yes. if I haven't emailed it to yes. all my listeners already. <laughs> well, let's let's do one. Let's do our reflection moment because I do yes. think to reflect because we gave them a lot of information. So I'll go first. I will say this report for me, once again, validated a lot of things that I think our clients or at least my clients really need to hear that they're not still in their only experiences, um, specifically around how organizations and the movement of their careers are happening. I do think they're still having their only experiences in very specific and unique ways or very much um, ways in which are, are becoming such they're being marginalized. That's, that hasn't changed. But the shared experience around what is happening in the workplace, I think this is where that validation happens. My other part of me is just really angry. And angry is a hard word for me because, you know, that means I'm putting a lot of energy in it. But for me, I'm still angry that this is not the top priority given where we are. Because if we really want to have... Um, a work environment, a work culture, or we want to attract the next generation into the workforce, then the time is yesterday. You know what I mean? Like, this is not the time for us to still be having the same conversation because the one thing we have learned is that this generation has faced a lot of things and they are opting out to save themselves. So if we are not creating work environments and building places where not just women, but the next generation of our workforce can find themselves in those spaces, then where are we as a country or in general have to start making some decisions about what these workforces are going to look like more globally? Because right now, you're not incentivizing the people that are currently here wanting to work, ambitious to work, and you're not giving them what they're asking for. And I don't you're think you're asking so much for talent. a lot. Yeah, and I don't no. think you're asking for a lot. And I include, not they, we are not asking for a lot. We're asking for you to see us as human beings and to think about the fact that what has been working ha is not working now. And that if you think in that same mindset, then that's not the, gonna be the success of your company. And the reason that's not gonna be the success of your company isn't about hybrid work. It's about, do you value me as a person that I spend my energy away from the things that I could be doing? Because I have many a talent in a place that you've created for us or me. So that's where I'm leaving. Liz, what you got? I mean, how can I come after that, girl? You just, uh, you know what I thought was interesting is like, I was just about to go into coach mode with your anger, but I agree. I mean, I think that's why I'm so like, when we first started this conversation, it was like, I, I was looking at a documentary on agitators, right? And it's like, why are we always like, it's like we're martyrs, right? And we're looking at the bad stuff. And it's, it's like having women in, I, I keep saying this, and I always say this, women need to be in every space. Diversity needs to be in every space. And, and like Shara said, right, this, it shouldn't be a surprise to you. This shouldn't be a shock to you. And if it is, then, you know, they're, let call us, yeah. Liz and Shara, and more yeah. than worse. And listen, financial institutions, 
who are funding companies, come back, get your backbones, and you mm-hmm. put back those metrics and up those metrics that y'all put in a couple of years ago, yep. like Black Rock and State Street, all of y'all. We're gonna tag y'all because yep. let me tell y'all, y'all put in metrics for board representation. You put in metrics and accountability, and guess what? People started shifting, right? Go ahead and up those numbers. Put, put those trickle it down. Message. Trickle it down. Yes, y'all got succession ESG. planning. Right. Y'all got ESG at the top of your mind. You got human capital at the top of your mind. Y'all putting it in the 10Ks. Y'all are putting it in all the places that, you know, SEC and all types of requirements to, and also in all types of reporting for shareholders to get excited. But let me tell you right now, it's all at the end of the day, this is about money. And this is about making sure we have a strong economy and, and strong companies, et cetera. But go on and put those metrics in there because what I'll tell you what, the people are here. They want to work. And the women, at the end of the day, whoever, however you came into this world, I'm sure you crossed one of us in your path. We here for it, but you are not maximizing the talent. You are spinning your wheels, trying to create what you had versus creating the future. So get with it, put some accountability out there for the people who are not doing it and make us work for equity and equality. And when I say we, I mean the companies who are making tons of money every day who don't have diverse executives or boards or C-suites or SVP suites or whatever, okay? Do your part. You control it. See, that's why I'm mad. I don't like y'all seeing me like this. This is not my spirit. This is not my normal spirit. I just, I just, I done hit that ceiling too many times. Like it, it is frustrating mm. to have talent yeah. that people don't want to you utilize. Yeah. Why I mean, this is, this, this is personal. This is personal. I mean, you know, like when we set up our coaching company shirt and I look like I have a mullet but um <laughs> you do, but I, I, I don't know what happened you did something it did take you back know. it took you back girl to girl <laughs> okay yeah um this is personal I mean you know I, I when I set up my coaching company I knew who I knew who my avatar was I knew exactly who my avatar was my avatar is a uh a, a, a woman of color in corporate America not in C-suite. They are the uh, contributors. They are the those leaders, but not leaders. We know who those are. They are the managers who don't feel like they belong, who there's all these disempowering beliefs, uh, who are constantly being told that um you have imposter syndrome and we'll get into imposter syndrome in another episode but let's get i brought this is my second time bringing up imposter syndrome we gotta talk know, about it it's just basically you know what i must say you know, because you like get get to research what imposter syndrome actually where it came from and like why i do not adhere to that word period. okay i don't have imposter syndrome okay i got that period. latina hustle and y'all know this period so it is personal and this is I'm not sure I understand. Siri doesn't Siri, understand me. That's because we started talking about financial institutions and change. Siri was like, nah, I already got the code for y'all. I already know y'all not supposed to be talking like this. Nah, they record now. Go get it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, sure. I think this is a great conversation. Yeah. I think it gives a, gives a lot of food for thought for people. Yes, we are. We, yes, we do. We are passionate about this. Yes, we do look you know, like we're mad, we're angry, we're, you should be too, everybody should, because this is going to trickle down, and it's going to have waves of impact, and we always talk about impact and legacy, what do you want your legacy to be like, thinking about future generations, and what do you want your impact to be, because what does this cost you, right, like you're so afraid to be diverse, and to do the work of diversifying your work, your workforce, because it's going to cost you money because you don't know what the return on investment is going to be because you aren't sure of saying the, you're afraid of saying the wrong thing, or you have these other fears, right? Or simply you're just uncomfortable with differences. Yeah. Okay. So, but reality is the implications of you not making the change go way beyond you 
and it, it's going to impact your your daughters and it's going to impact your daughter's daughters so that's and i'll say one last thing for those of us all in this work keep up the work because you know one person through is one is one more person through three people through is three more people through and actually the fact that this report language change and the awareness around it and the conversation around it means that something is happening and the change is happening so i don't want to be discouraging but as far no. as my my thoughts around this is we got to push harder but not at the expense of ourselves our well-being but at the end of the day we just need to hold people accountable and, and create more accountability around this if this is a part of your mission and your passion and your work. And if you are one of our clients who are still kind of feeling the burden of this and you feel the heavy in this every day, we want you to continue to do this work and find out when is the best places for you to be at the height of the push and when you need to allow others to do it for you because you need to rest and restore. And that is what we're always going to have to do. Those ebbs and flows are for a reason. They're to allow you to put the best energy when you at your height and put nothing or very little when you need to restore and let somebody else fight. But let me just be clear. This is a part of a collective journey. Don't put this on your back. But you put this in front of you as a sign to say enough is enough. Like we have to do more. And so, all right, we're going to thank y'all so much for listening to us today. Go check out the report, Women in the Workplace, um, Lean In Energy and McKinsey and Company. Thank you so much for putting out this and create, created a great conversation. Liz, tell them where they can find us. Uh, follow us on Instagram at More Than Words Podcast. Y'all send us an email, Liz and Shara at More Than Words Podcast. We're going to have some amazing things happening uh, next year. Shara and I are in the planning phase um, of our of our 2023. It's going to be exciting. Y'all know it's going to be so, so good. So follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. We have a community connections page as well too. It's a group and we're going to start pushing out some content that's exclusive to that group. So please follow us. And I will say one last thing. I just finished the book of joy with Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama and a little hope. One of the biggest takeaways I got from this book was through adversity, you will have joy. Mm. Have a Thank good day, y'all. <laughs> See you later. Bye. <laughs>